So you've already seen this. I just wanted to review it for you guys, but also um, because these are pretty, this is a pretty, like wildfires are huge, hurricanes are the next big one, and then probably earthquakes. For us, those are the three probably most significant ones. So I want to make sure um, that even though you've watched at your leisure, uh, that these things are making sense. So I'm going to go through this pretty fast, um, but uh, I want to make sure if you guys have any questions about stuff, interrupt me, and this is your chance to, to if something didn't make sense in my previous lecture. Um, this background image are all the cyclonic uh, storm traces for about the last uh, 20 years or so-ish, 25 years. Um, and so not all these are, are hurricane strength storms, but the point is there's all, this, this is a common feature of our part of the world, right? This, is, this, is a, this has been going on forever, it will be going on forever, et cetera. Um, I have a video here that I played and you guys, you guys hopefully could see in the video. Long story short, it basically just shows some dramatic uh, hurricane um, footage. Um, and, uh, and hurricanes, like wildfires, like, um, like uh, uh, wildfires, earthquakes, all those things, can be very visually dramatic. And so it makes for very sort of scary pictures and very, um, you know, tantalizing uh, lead in to evening news and that kind of stuff. But um, I want to make sure that uh, uh, we're all, even though we had this in the quiz a little bit ago, that we're understanding that, again, these disasters have huge impacts. It's not just the, the immediate incident and then the immediate wake, but there can be long tails to these things. Indeed, many of them have long tails. And so examples of consequential hurricanes, um, the term kamikaze, right? People associate that with World War II and suicide guys in airplanes and stuff, but the name of divine wind actually comes from um, essentially a hurricane that drove out uh, the invading hordes coming from the western part of Asia trying to invade Japan. And, um, and, 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 uh, and you know, these invaders got swamped by this thing. Uh, same thing in and, uh, the Americas, right? Um, when Columbus is, um, is coming over to the New World, um, uh, he basically hears all of these tales from across the Caribbean. The, the terms are slightly enunciated slightly differently, but you know, in all these different languages, they all talk about a, a similar sound um, for this sort of god of wind in this crazy, crazy storm period. And that's what gives us our term hurricanes. Um, in terms of the founding of the United States of America, hurricanes play a consequential role. And um, essentially, uh, we, uh, down in the Caribbean, the uh, European powers get whacked. And, um, and in particular, one of the reasons that the British were not able to mount a counteroffensive um, in, 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 the key, in the key decisive battle of or one of the key decisive battles of the American Revolution and why Cornwallis surrenders at Yorktown is because he didn't have the ship support, didn't have the big fleet coming and backing him up and the French blockaded and, and sent us ships. So, so if we hadn't had this hurricane that destroyed these British ships, we would be uh, um, speaking a different, uh, at least a different dialect right now. Um, uh, and, and these things, as dramatic as those are, there are also other consequences. When we talked about Haiti, we talked about um, the issue of uh, you know, an impact uh, playing out uh, societally, not so much a, a revolution per se or something, but, but having a long tail. And indeed, uh, this 1899 hurricane in, in Puerto Rico really um, whacked the economy of that island, and it hasn't really ever fully recovered. So it changed, uh, it changed how um, the economy worked, and it, it, it reduced um, food, it, it led to less food production happening across the island, and importantly, less subsistence farming, where people just sort of grew their own food, and they were cool, and they were able to make a living, and it became much more a sort of command control and commodities uh, type of economy, and that makes, and that unfortunately has made the people of Puerto Rico vulnerable to, to all kinds of other things, political machinations, other natural disasters, et cetera. Um, 
And, uh, and then, of course, uh, the Galveston earthquake uh, that you guys correctly noted in the quiz was the most, uh, the l most lethal hurricane to strike um, the U.S. in recorded history. We weren't keeping great notes back then, and the destruction was so complete of the entirety of this sort of barrier sand island just uh, you know, off the mainland in Texas, um, we don't have good estimates. So it's at least 6,000 people died and maybe much more like 10,000. Galveston was the epicenter of, uh, of the Texas economy. It was the cultural capital. There were opera houses. There were uh, you know, banking and all that kind of jazz. Um, and this, her and this, was, this also gave, helped give birth to the modern weather service, our, moder our modern federal um, monitoring of weather and reporting out and, for and, and the beginning of forecasting of weather. Um, but at this time, we didn't really have good, um, good info. Um, nevertheless, Galveston still exists. You can still go out to Galveston today, but it is a shadow of what it used to be. So essentially, so complete was the destruction on the island that the powers that be upended, left Galveston, and went inland to Houston. And that's why Houston is the fourth largest city in the US right now after uh, uh, New York, LA, and Chicago. Um, was because of this retrenchment and this, this investment in infrastructure and, and uh, finance and all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so the Galveston hurricane was, was incredibly important. Um, and this is what that Galveston uh, hurricane looked like. This, at the time, we were not naming storms. And so we don't have like Hurricane Katrina or Hurricane Harvey. We don't have a, we don't have a, a name like that. So we just call this the Galveston Hurricane of 1900. But what you're seeing are, are um, on the um, upper left is a, a church and then everything else around it was leveled. The lower left is an image of just looking across the island. And this is like, you know, eight to 10 feet of just rubble boards, right? Everything is completely, you know, there's dead bodies there. There's people's houses, there's businesses. There, I mean, everything was just, I mean, how difficult to navigate this, um, let alone to recover people or rebuild. Huge task, huge task, especially back in the 1900s. Um, massive numbers of bodies, and so th those are some um, unfortunate folks that, that did not survive the storm. Um, and, and just it was, it was a nightmare trying to recover there. Um, in the wake of that, they decide what they're going to do, as we often do, is rather than live with nature, we're going to fight nature. And so what Galveston established was a seawall. And that's what you see in this postcard in 1903, a couple years afterwards, they're working on essentially building a giant barrier. So this will never happen again. Um, this is what that uh, seawall looked like um, in 2008 um, as Ike was coming ashore. So um, the best, and this is a memorial to the, the folks that passed away in the 1900 hurricane, um, right? Uh, the best barriers can't stand up to this increasingly powerful series of storms that our planet is, is churning out. So, um, and also, th that's your beach, right? No more beach, just got a concrete wall. And so the quality of life, the ecological functioning, ecosystem services, all those things degrade when we, when we take actions uh, like this. And so, um, you know, the tourism economy isn't really happening as it could because would you go want to hang out on that, that beautiful concrete beach right there? You know, probably, probably not. Okay, then I have some more, more videos about hurricanes. Um, uh, so, so hurricanes are a form of a cyclonic storm. It's just spinning around. It's just a spinning, 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 spinning. Uh, where we are in the northern hemisphere, they spin counterclockwise. In the southern hemisphere, they spin clockwise. Same exact phenomenon, just right-handed or left-handed, basically. Um, the, na the nomenclature is, um, is region-driven right, and generally from the traditional peoples in those areas. So we call uh, our part of the world, um, a we call these storms a hurricane when they get strong. We call them um, a cyclone when they're in the South Pacific, and we call them a typhoon when they're in and around Asia or the Middle East. But again, same exact thing. Um, so if you were doing a, um, a uh, uh, case study and you were looking for examples, you'd want to type in the you know, search term hurricane and cyclone and typhoon because 
because they're, they're going to pick up different um, uh, studies or reports or, or you know, news coverage or whatever, depending on where the storm um, is actually uh, uh, coming from. Um, the main deal that you should, other than the fact that there are different terms for this, the same um, weather phenomenon, um, realize that the key thing is just a difference in degree, right? So the, the, um, the official naming is based on uh, if we cross certain thresholds, they're all, they all start as a tropical depression, which is a little teeny tiny storm, basically, or, or the makings of a storm. And then we actually get a formal tropical storm, which is what, which what the weather people would call a storm, a formal storm. Once the wind speed gets above 74 miles per hour for at least one minute, that, in our part of the world, that triggers the hurricane uh, a definition. And then if it spins really, really fast uh, and above 111 miles per hour, that becomes a so-called major hurricane, right? Why, why do we pick 74 miles per hour? Why do we pick 111? It's, these are um, uh, operationally defined. This isn't some theoretical um, uh, uh, you know, analysis that produced these things. Um, with our current naming system, uh, hurricanes go from category one to category five. And so you'll sometimes hear, um, this, is, this is most uh, confusing, you'll sometimes hear this with um, uh, hurricane Sandy, people talk about Hurricane Sandy. Technically, Sandy wasn't a hurricane. It was a it was a um, it was a storm. It was a tropical storm, but that didn't seem to do justice for the impact. So people have taken on using the term Superstorm Sandy, right? So like cause it, it clearly helps to have a moniker. We can we can search for stuff. We can communicate it to one another. So so um, so yeah. I'm going fairly fast. Is this making sense, everybody? Anything, any questions so far? Okay. So um, the categories of hurricane, where we get these from, not, uh, not uh, meteorologists, not uh, you know, climate physicists, or anything like that. Where, where we have our current, uh, current category from, uh, we're folks in essentially the American Red Cross, or the International Red Cross, going to help folks particularly in Central America. So when we have a disaster and we send out teams from, from a NGO, one of the first things we do is send a reconnaissance group, right? Let's go check. And so those are the people, the first on the ground, they're not so much helping people, they're more just assessing to figure out, to tell the rest of the group what, what resources we need to send in, right? Oh my God, we need a lot more food here, or oh my gosh, we need, we need medicine, or oh my gosh, we need to evacuate, or whatever it is, right? And so um, a, a team was doing that, and they, they started saying, man, I need a, we need a better, um, a better uh, guideline before we get on the ground. We need some sort of better forecasting tool. And so at the time, what they were seeing was much of the damage in terms of Central America uh, uh, was coming from, so a lot of the, the residences weren't super robustly built and kind of you know, small villages and stuff like that. And so the, the big impact they saw were to roofs and, and essentially wind damage, either wind ripping off structures or wind blowing other debris into structures and causing damage. So they came up with this, uh, they were the first ones to propose this. So this is based on essentially likely, uh, likelihood of causing structural damage is why we have these categories. And so a category one, there's, there's likely to be not a huge amount of, of wind damage, maybe some flood damage, but not a huge amount. And then as we progress over to the right, we get to catastrophic damage, where essentially every structure is going to be damaged, at least to some extent. And many would be just outright destroyed if they weren't reinforced or something of that nature. So that's where we get our categories, uh, our, our, our storm categories from. Um, uh, so, uh, what will, and, and so how the hurricane spins around, I forget what I, what I yeah, okay. So, um, so a hurricane is gonna, so, so is gonna be spinning around. There's a couple different things that will lead to um, the initiation and then the strengthening of the storm. And what you'll of, oftentimes hear are these two, these two things that come from um, the forecasting or the folks that are trying to warn people to get ready. One is the so-called sustained winds. This is not gusts. This isn't 
this isn't the meter ticked up for a second. This is continuous, uh, got no weaker than for at least 60 seconds. Um, and so in the case of Typhoon Nancy, this is the, I mean, these things always change. Every couple years there's some new thing and it takes a couple years to get verified by the World Meteorological Organization. But suffice it to say, uh, um, for a long time, Typhoon Nancy has held the highest sustained wind speeds of 213 miles per hour. That is insane. There's no way, there's no way you could stand, if you were naked outside, just, just sand blowing would, would you know, cut your cheeks open, right? It's, 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 it's very, very difficult to imagine um, surviving something like this. And in that case, you just want to hunker down and hope, hope it blows, blow, goes past you very quickly. Um, and then the other uh, thing is the, the, the pressure, the air pressure uh, inside the eye of the storm, right? And so, so the, because it's a, it's a, we're talking about a pressure differential between high pressure and low pressure, and when those differentials are greatest, that's when we get the strongest winds. So the lower, so, so the greatest the pressure difference is, that's where we get um, you know, stronger winds. So you'll, you'll, hear, you'll hear sustained winds, and, and lowest pressure as two big markers. Another uh, big storm was um, TIP, which is 190 miles per hour, and uh, very similar, almost uh, 870 millibars. Um, but um, interestingly, what we're seeing now, and this, this one sort of speaks to that, is um, we're now understanding uh, in recent decades, especially with things like Katrina, Harvey, et cetera, um, it's not, the damage isn't just the speed or the intensity of the spinning, but it's also the scale of the storm, right? And as we also talked about, it might also be how fast it's moving. So now we're realizing that um, while wind speed is a, is a fine starter thing, there are other dimensions to these storms. So they might have the same wind speed, but if the, th if the storm is, you know, 20 miles wide versus 200 miles wide, obviously we're gonna have a lot more damage in the 200 mile wide storm. Um, uh, this is uh, looking down on a, um, a uh, merry-go-round or a, or a, yeah, I guess call it a merry-go-round. Uh, and so um, this is illustrating the apparent force, so-called the Coriolis uh, effect. And so um, that red ball, we're shooting in a straight line. It's that red ball and just boom, it's going straight. I, I, I shot it out of my canyon and it's just charging. But if you and I were on the merry-go-round, and so it would look like it's bending, which is what that red curve is tracing. And so that apparent bending is because the Earth is spinning, and so our atmosphere isn't attached to the rocks, right? And so, so the atmosphere can spin separate from the rocks. So when air starts to move and our spinning Earth below it moves, we get this bending of, of stuff. And that leads to these different bands of circulation cells in the atmosphere. And so these are called things like the trade winds and all that kind of stuff. Um, without going into oceanography or coastal management, or whatever right now, suffice it to say, this slices our atmosphere up into different latitudinal bands. And so it turns out that, um, well, yeah, I'll just say that it turns out that we can't get hurricanes right at the dead, at the dead middle of the equator. So we get them a little north of the equator, a little south of the equator. Um, uh, and you'll see that, and so this is where a lot, of our hur a lot of our hurricanes, we do have hurricanes that strike Baja, Mexico. Sometimes the, 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 the tail comes up to us as we saw this summer in California. And we'll be seeing more of that with climate change. But, but the big story, the most intense stories for our country are the Atlantic hurricanes and they tend to come off of essentially dust storms off of Africa, after, uh, off of West Africa, and they tend to form out here. Um, uh, when they form, um, we have a couple different things, but they'll start to spin, and then they, there's many things that can go wrong. There's many things that can break up a hurricane, um, and when we talk about Hurricane Katrina, we'll talk about uh, that. So there's many things that can go wrong, but if the, if the you know, stars align, and we get the great fuel, and we don't get disruptive crosswinds and things, we will get this formation of the storm, and this is the, the basic structure. So we have the center of the storm, the so-called eye of the storm, which above it has no clouds. So if we were there, and I was above us, and we would look up, 
it would it would you know um, a blue sky kind of thing, right? Sunny, you know that kind of thing if it's daytime. Um, so the most intense winds are in the areas around the eye. Um, and then from there, there are different concentric bands of, of spinning, uh, moving air with, with both wind speed, torrential rain, et cetera. And then down on the water surface, we have the storm surge push, pushing uh, forward. Storm surge, uh, we've mentioned this a couple times, but just real quickly, right? So storm surge is that, is that lump of water that's being shoved in front of the storm. And, uh, and for us in California, it's a problem, right? We see beach erosion. If you live in Oxnard Shores or something, it's a problem. If you're maybe in Venice, that's a problem. Um, but for you know, our campus here, we're generally protected from storm surge. For most, most of California is up down, geologically very young. So you know, still a problem for our immediate coastlands, but not so much. Whereas other places, again, like the Gulf Coast or the East Coast, um, where we have those very active Atlantic hurricanes is both the fact that they're getting a lot of hurricanes coming in and their geography makes them super vulnerable to hurricanes. It's pancake, it's flatland, right? So, so for us, you know, I get the thing I always tell in all my lectures, but, but um, so you, if, if we took a rock, we go out to Point Magoo here, and I take a rock, like a, you know, fit in my hand rock, and I throw it as hard as I can, it's gonna hit the water and sink. And, you know, I don't know how far I can throw it. It's probably going to go to, you know, 40 feet deep, maybe, right? Off the point we go 40, 50 feet deep, right? If I take that same rock, throw it with that, and go to, say, um, where our sites are in Louisiana, and I throw it with the same force, same size of rock, same dimension, throw it just as far, and it hits and it lands, it's going to go in, like, a foot of water or, or three feet of water or something like that, right? So, so th the very, very flat geography makes them susceptible, not just all the, all the rain and everything, but particularly storm surge. So these flat pancake areas, that's where we have the biggest problem. So, the, so while the southeastern US is screwed, the most screwed place in the world is Southeast Asia. Bangladesh, very, very low-lying uh, country, very, very at sea level for miles and miles inland. So when we get one of these storm surges, it's hugely problematic. A lot of the folks there, uh, uh, you know, high poverty rates, a lot of subsistence farming, rice and things like that. So a storm surge not only is going to cause destruction, but also it, it oftentimes will spoil the crops that people are depending on, you know, for their food uh, livelihood. So storm surge is a huge problem. Um, I don't remember if I, what this one was about. Oh yeah, okay, so this one is, yeah, great, thanks dude. Don't worry about that. Okay, so th this is, uh, you guys should watch that, but this is just um, a summary of Katrina. But, but in the context of introduction to hurricanes, let's talk about the formation of Katrina, and maybe we'll probably stop about here. Um, but, but there's all of these different things. So think of hurricane formation. Earthquake, pressure, 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 shake. Wildfire, set the fuels up, light it. Um, hurricanes have a much more specific recipe that we have to have A and B and C and D. They all have to line up. And so, um, uh, in terms of how we form hurricanes, the, wa the surface water has to be warm. So the, the hurricanes do not form in the Arctic, for example. Uh, generally speaking, it has to be um, more than about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, uh, down, you know, tens of meters deep, right? So it has to be warm, warm water. Not, not, a, not an inch, not, not a skimming uh, warm little lens, but, but a, a layer of warm water. Next, we need to have the conditions such that the atmosphere is a lot cooler than that warm water. And so that, that's going to, you know, tend to induce the atmosphere to move up. And so think of like a, a fireplace kind of thing, like a chimney kind of thing. Uh, then we have to have um, uh, a lot of moisture in the higher part of the atmosphere to, again, help with the energy transfer and stuff like that. So think of that as fuel. Um, and again, we can't be at the equator. We need some amount of spinning. And we're right at the equator, the winds are going to go right or left. They're not going to deflect right or left. So there has to be some amount of, of, of Coriolis force which is not a real force, it's an apparent force, but, but th this, this sort of bending of winds and stuff. Um, and then we need some type of spark. We do not really understand this part very well. 
So it seems to be dust particle, for our Atlantic hurricanes, it seems to be dust particle driven off of um, uh, sort of sandstorms and, and, and desert, you know, big, huge, giant, large scale, um, uh, a storm sweeping across the Sahara and stuff like that. But, but we're not entirely sure. Um, there's something, something that starts it and then it kicks it off. And then lastly, which this isn't, this isn't, you don't have to have number six, but this is something you have to not have. And that is you can't have any crosswinds. So in the very, very early stages, as the thing is, as the, the cyclonic disturbance is starting to happen, um, you, you can think of like, you know, you guys sometimes are in the bathtub and you pull the plug of the bathtub and you, you swirl your finger around the drain and kind of, like if you, if you let it go, the water just kind of goes down. But if you swirl your finger around the drain, um, you do it once and nothing happens, you do it two or three times, get it kind of get, and then it kind of forms a little whirlpool. That's essentially what's happening with our uh, cyclones. And so, so if you start that up and then, and then kind of kick it with your foot or whatever and, and break up that, that circular spinning, it won't, it won't form, right? And so that's what we're talking about. So we have to have low wind shear. We have to have low crosswinds so the atmosphere uh, uh, side to side is essentially mellow. There, is, there aren't a bunch of things coming through and, and kicking over the, the spool around the drain, so to speak. Um, in the context of Hurricane Katrina, um, which is sort of our classic modern hurricane that everybody references, both in terms of storm formation, but also in terms of um, uh, examples of disasters, environmental disasters, um, which uh, we have a whole lecture on after this. But basically, um, leading up to that, leading up to that, that 2005 hurricane season, um, firstly, there's some long-term patterns that are going on. So we have some eras that are sort of very hurricane-y, some eras that are very non-hurricane-y. Um, and we were in, when this, before Hurricane Katrina hit, we knew we were in a so-called active multi-decadal period. And what that means is we saw, we were seeing more hurricanes than the quote-unquote normal background starting in about the mid-90s. Uh, El Ninos, we're used to thinking about El Ninos, like this year getting a lot of rain and, and you know, causing these, these distinct um, in, inputs in different places in the world. And our part of the world, we tend to be, when, the, when El Nino uh, exerts fully, we tend to get wetter winters. And what it means for the Atlantic <clears throat> is we tend to not have hurricane formation. We tend to, we tend to uh, 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 screw with the conditions that make it. So actually, El Ninos reduce hurricanes on the eastern seaboard. <clears throat> Next, we have a, a hot sea surface temperature, so above, above normal <clears throat> temperatures of the ocean. And uh, this, th as we're going into the season, we're predicting for in the coming weeks uh, a pretty favorable wind conditions and air pressure, et cetera. All of that translated to, so we have two groups that do forecasting of hurricanes in the US for each season, <clears throat> uh, climate modelers. Uh, one is the National Hurricane Center, one is essentially the federal government, and the other is um, sort of also the government, but, but a research lab in Colorado. Or, 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 or yeah, I'll just say that. Um, and so we have two sort of independent uh, looks at them. They, they do sli take slightly different, different approaches. But what we were told before the start of the hurricane season in 2005, which is about this time of year is when these, when these predictions come out uh, for the summer and fall, that we were 175%, not above normal, but we were 175% above the hyperactive baseline. So everybody was ringing the bells. Hey, this is not gonna be like, maybe we'll have some hurricanes. Like, oh my God, it's gonna be crazier than the crazy time. So everybody, please get ready. And so this is the data uh, that we were looking at going in to 2000, the 2005 hurricane season. So tropical storms, hurricanes, major hurricanes, you know that that's just a difference in the speed of the storm, right? the intensity of the storm, it's all the same thing. So we can go from the left to the right, we're getting stronger and stronger storms. These uh, forecasting centers tell us what their average prediction is, um, uh, and, then, uh, and then what the range that they're predicting. 
And so if we jump down to, uh, so the, the, this is like an above normal season, a near normal season, a below normal. So a below normal season would say be an El Nino year, for example, that kind of stuff. And so in 2005, what we were seeing was that, so this is what, this is what was reported at the start of the season, just before the start of the season. Um, 18 to 21 tropical storms, which is crazy, right? Uh, think of a normal, a near normal year is about 6 to 14, right? So that's a lot more tropical storms. And then obviously we have few, as we go up to the right, with the more intense storms, there's fewer of those, but still look at the pattern. So a, nor, a quote unquote normal is something like four to eight. These guys were predicting nine to 11 hurricanes. And then the major hurricanes, normally we'd see something like one or two or three maybe. Um, they're predicting five to seven. This is what we actually had. We actually had 28 tropical storms. But, you know, this is after you know, the end of 2005 season. Uh, we found, had 28 of the tropical storms. We had 15 hurricanes, and we had seven major hurricanes. This, is, this was a very, 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 very stormy year. A very, very, and so obviously any one of these things can be problematic, but think about it in the context of our disaster conversations. Um, uh, you know, the, when we have back to back and a bang and a bang and a bang, as horrible as one of those bangs is, when you have a second or a third or a fourth, it just compounds that, right? You're trying to recover, you're trying to turn off the gas or put out the fire, and then another storm comes, right? So it's just, it's very difficult to navigate that, not just physically, but also psychologically, right? You just get, you just get beat down kind of thing. Um, okay. And this is what, this is what it, it looked like um, leading up to uh, Katrina. And so what we're looking at are satellite images of, on the, on the top, the, the temperature of the ocean. So the hotter the color, the warmer it is. And so we've talked about the fact that these, these storms come out, you know, sort of start somewhere around here, right? Come off of this, this part of Africa, and they kind of start and they kind of go this way. Check it out. As they're getting closer to our infrastructure, to our homes, to our businesses, the color, the hotness grows. So the fuel is getting stronger. So as, we get, as we're getting closer and closer to what we're worried about, it, they're getting stronger and stronger, maybe faster and faster. All these different things are changing. Um, and then it's essentially just a different version of that on the bottom, which is anomalies. So this is for that month or, the, or that, that day of the year, um, how do we compare to normal? And so however you want to talk about it, just raw temperature or how warmer it is compared to recent times, it was a very um, challenging time. And then we had very low wind shear, right? So, so um, this minus indicates uh, less crosswinds. And so, so in this corridor where we're forming the storm, there, it, was, it was anomalously quiet. It was anom anomalously mellow. And so that helped with the forming of the storm. Okay, just to wrap up here then, um, uh, these are the so-called spaghetti diagrams that we see. And so this is an example that we see from, uh, uh, you know, there's a couple different ways. So what we're looking at are different predictive models. Just like with climate change, we use supercomputers to take what we've learned and we get better every year at predicting these, these storms. But, you know, ha have a look. So this is, so this prediction starts here. So all these, all these storms are starting here. And these are predicted storm tracks where we think they might go. The names refer, the, or the letters refer to the different model, right? It doesn't matter which one for us since we're not climate modelers, but it's just, you know, model one, model two, model three. And um, have a look. So there's, there's this wacko comes over here. There's this wacko that comes over here, but most of them tend to have a fairly, you know, there's some fairly close agreement that they, in this case, this storm is predicted to go up, sort of hit the east coast of Florida and then kind of bang up and go into Georgia and the Carolinas, that kind of thing, right? So again, we call these spaghetti diagrams because they look like maybe you had some spaghetti and you threw it on the table. And so these are really helpful. Um, what we've moved to, and so you can still you can get all these data products from, uh, for free from, from our weather services or they'll report them on the news or whatever in the newspaper. Um, this is a, a, perhaps a more, um, a more useful thing. So instead of showing all of those deals, right, um, this is looking at, um, same idea, so this, this modeling starts here in this, with this particular storm. Here's where we're starting. And then we're modeling it at different steps into the future. 
And uh, so you'll note, and so here, these little dotted lines, that's the, the older spaghetti, or the way we used to report it, spaghetti diagrams. And so now we've sort of taken the averages of all those, right? And so, so this is where the eye would be, or the core of the storm, the center of the storm, right? And, um, and uh, the larger the circle, that represents our uncertainty. So right, so if we talk about, you know, like, Time step one to time step two, we're pretty sure it's going to be, you know, in this case, it's going to be hitting this, you know, around Miami kind of area, right? But as we start to go farther out in the future, well, maybe it's this model or maybe it's this model. And so, and so the cone of uncertainty grows. Um, so these are very helpful, but what we're also finding is the public does not know how to read these oftentimes. So they look at this and they see, ah, the storm is going exactly here, right? That's what they see. And so if you live here, you're like, oh my God, we're going to be whacked, right? And if you live over here, right, right here, you're like, oh, thank God it's going to miss me. It doesn't say that. It says that it's probably going to miss you, but it doesn't say, because check it out, here's, here's a couple tracks that go right over my house. So, um, so uh, sometimes our, our communication, or I shouldn't say sometimes, our communication can always be getting better, can always be getting better. This is just us trying to be better technical communicators. I can't leave, can, we can't wrap this up without mentioning that there are disingenuous actors that, that for various reasons want to get into it. And most conspicuously, this was unfortunately the president a few years ago, where um, uh, for just political reasons that I don't really want to talk about other than, than the fact that they're impacting on our preparedness, um, took, this is a real data product, so he's holding up there a real uh, model with cones of uncertainty, okay, in this case this is Dor Hurricane Dorian, and it's predicting just like I showed you, like where the, the eye of the storm is forecasted to be, right? And as we move out, there's more and more uncertainty, and this is where we predicted. He literally took a Sharpie and said, oh, and it might impact Alabama, right? There's no science there, there's no, there's, the, the model didn't say that. And went on national news and told everybody this is where the storm would go. Now, I would hope that you would take your guidance from a weather professional and a disaster expert, not a politician, whoever that politician is. But um, the, the weird times we live in mean that even with objective data products, uh, they are essentially, some people think they're fodder for spinning things. So, so again, um, this is silly and nonsensical and does not make any sense. But unfortunately, some people thought some people read more into this than they should have. So in general, this is a great tool. We want to uh, keep using these tools, but as with all these things, we want to make sure we understand the uncertainty. And just because, in the case of a hurricane prediction, just because um, we're not in the immediate uh, you know, middle of the line, we should still be worried. Failing to heed these warnings, same with us with fire evacuations, failing to evacuate when there's a fire coming, can set you up for really, really bad times, right? And as much as, as and the key thing here is um, probably most of us can get out in the wildfire. The biggest concern in, in disaster are folks that don't have the same means that we all have. So they don't have a vehicle, they have some health concern, they have to have a, an oxygen machine that has to be plugged in or whatever, so they can't just, you know, quote unquote, evacuate willy nilly. So that's why we need to have these great data products and have them be as objective and, and reasonable as possible.